Hi, my name's Sam Bevan and I work on the advertising solutions team here at Snap. To put it simply, I work with advertisers to ensure they exceed their marketing goals. Today, we're going to be showcasing the world of e-commerce on Snapchat. From virtual stores, to immersive ads, to shoppable augmented reality, this really is a world of unlimited potential. We'll start by stating the obvious. E-commerce exploded in 2020, accelerating the shift away from physical stores towards digital online shopping. At Snapchat, we have built towards this future and we're already asking what's next and what does the future look like? To answer these questions, Snap's VP of EMEA, Claire Velotti, will be joined by Flora McDonald, the fashion and luxury editor at the Financial Times and founder of its digital festival, NextGen. We're excited to hear their thoughts on the evolving e-commerce industry, their views on the next generation of consumers, and get an understanding from them why they think platforms like Snapchat are capturing this generation's attention. Our growing community of over 265 million daily active users are already using Snapchat to discover new brands, show off their purchases and shop. It is essential for brands to understand this generation is different and that they do things differently. To explore this further, we'll be joined by a creative strategy lead, Simon Jenkins, who will be sharing how brands can innovate with our camera in the commerce journey. Product marketing manager, Megan Raab, will then introduce you to the Snapchat generation, their shopping behaviors, and explain how brands tell their story to a community who love to tell theirs. Whether you're looking to drive incremental sales or launch a new product with an augmented reality experience, Snapchat can help you drive results in the face of change. Welcome to Shopping Through a New Lens. Good morning. I'm Claire Velotti, the VP of our Amir business here at Snap. And I can't tell you how delighted I am to be joined by Flora McDonald Johnson, who is the fashion and luxury editor at the FT for the Financial Times, that is, is the correct term. But she really is a leading voice on style, the world of luxury e-commerce, which we're gonna talk a lot about this morning. And most importantly, which is something very important to us in our business, is really understanding what's important to Generation Z and young, millennial, young millennials, rather. So welcome, Flora. I am delighted uh, that you are here this morning. Well, thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to talk all things e-com. Now, should we start, I always think it's useful to start at the beginning and talk a little bit about your uh, various jobs, I think it's fair to say. Uh, the job you obviously have as a journalist at the Financial Times, but clearly the amazing work you are doing around uh, Generation uh, Z. Well, I'm, my kind of day to day at the FT is covering fashion and luxury, and that's also including beauty. So I could be reporting on list hottest trend reports to caring's re results to the state of the gym industry to the best lipsticks to buy. So it's really kind of fun and I get to cover a lot of topics and, you know, attend runway shows and do lots of things like that. But in 2019, I started FT Next Gen, which is a branch of the business that essentially caters to our younger readers, but also trying to get younger subscribers. Um, so kind of Next Gen's purpose, as it were, was I just think the FT is this massive, amazing hub of information that's well researched there's incredible content but it feels a bit inaccessible to the younger generation i mean you know so often people don't even know that the ft cover fashion and cool things yeah. with culture so i really wanted to gather our young editors and create a space which young people could access easily and get this information but also create a younger culture at the ft um, so we started with a festival and now in 2021 we've got this kind of hybrid festival of physical and digital so it's all really kicking off this year i think it's fair to say you're an incredibly busy woman um, and <laughs> a lot that you don't do because to add to that 
Um, I think it's also fair to say that you are particularly passionate and a champion um, for the retail industry overall. And I think you've been doing a lot of work, particularly uh, with the impact of COVID. We just have to see it firsthand when we walk down um, our high streets in, in, in the case in London. Um, and you've been doing a lot about partnering with Appear here for, say, the street initiatives. And if you could talk a little bit about that, because I think that's something a lot of people tuning in today are juggling, you know, this balance between the physical and digital, but thinking about the role of the physical world. Absolutely. I think, you know, COVID-19 really, really disrupted uh, the high street, the streets in general. Uh, stores were forced to close down apart from essential shops. And this meant that the retail industry, and that includes kind of the beauty industry were really demolished almost overnight. And the BFC in 2019 said that the fashion industry alone employed 890,000 people. And, you know, we're excluding certain sectors there. And suddenly no one had a job, no one had a, a backstop. All of our retail spaces closed. And the government started these schemes to, you know, eat out, to help out. And there was kind of like, but, you know, what about what about retail? What about all the people who work in the retail industry? Where's the government support for that? Where's our plans in place for the future? And that's why I got involved with Appear Here, which is founded by Ross Bailey. He's also spoken at the Next Gen Festival. But, you know, we both kind of had this vision, which was why why, is, why aren't the, these protections in place for the retail sector when there's something like the food sector? And now, of course, it's come out with... Rishi Sunak's plan that actually only helped the, you know, eat out to help out scheme, the economy by about two weeks. So there was all this effort poured into that. Yeah. And the fashion industry is so important. It employs so many people. It generates huge amounts of money for the economy. And so hopefully now going forward with all of these petitions and government lobbying, we're going to see better, you know, um, we're going to see better things from the government in place to protect that sector. So that's really what it was kind of about. Well, I'd say here, here, I think there's lots of, uh, my parents have got a hotel, so I also saw it firsthand, they struggled. Yeah. Um, I think what was interesting, actually, because I chatted with Jose from Farfetch, who's the founder of Farfetch, and he talked a lot about, and I never really thought about it like this, why the physical world, particularly in luxury, is really important. Because if you go into a sort of a data, sort of a high street chain store versus a luxury store, yeah, I mean, there's a distinct difference why you've bought, bought into luxury, because you're having a different experience. And he was saying why luxury, in a way, got hit even harder because although, of course, they moved to e-com, it still was harder to make that experience different in an e-com environment. So I thought that was a really fascinating insight I hadn't really mm -hmm. thought about. Um, so I think that that's something I know we're going to talk about luxury in a minute. So I will go on to that. But, but before we do, um, for someone who does an awful lot, it'd be good to hear about how you personally, um, I suppose, coped and how you've had to adapt during the during the COVID or during the pandemic. Full stop. Um, and what have you supposed to learn? And any positive experiences that you're going to take away from it? Well, I think like uh, you know, a lot of young people, it was tons of up and downs for me. I think originally I was kind of quite excited to be at home and actually press pause on my life a little bit, you know, pre-pandemic, going to Paris for runway shows, doing lots of events, uh, yeah. kind of always rushing around. I felt like I really never took that much time for myself. So originally I was really enjoying just being at home, re-engaging with my family, you know, over Zoom calls and whatever, and just having kind of more time for me. But then I am a, someone who really enjoys rushing about. So before I knew it, I was suddenly, you know, on your kind of like once daily walk turned into like 20K like runs <laughs> around London just, just to do stuff. But, um, you know, so I, I think I really struggled. And writing at a laptop all day, I felt the kind of enjoyment would sometimes really there and I'd really get into a feature and feel inspired and sometimes I'd become quite enclosed on myself. But, you know, I think the positives which I took actually is I never knew how to switch off before um, and how important it was because suddenly we were all on our laptops and on our phones and watching Netflix. And so if you really wanted to switch off, everything had to go. And now I'm a lot better at putting those kind of boundaries in place. And I think probably to the benefit of my colleagues, who no longer <laughs> emails for me um late at night i think i'm way more respectful to them and to myself now now we've touched on the impact of, of the fashion industry in terms of sort of the physical stores but it's fair to say i think fashion has fundamentally changed from run uh, runway shows and so on so you know what do you see kind of our kind of more the long-term uh, impact and changes we're going to see 
Well, I think now we're kind of entering into that era of digital and physical realm. And I think, you know, for retailers, they really have to think about how they're going to tailor their experience. And what I really liked, there was a recent McKinsey report, which said the word bionic. And what that means is best of human interaction and automated interaction. And what that means is, you know, in order to kind of keep retail driving forward, brands and e-com are going to have to kind of hit that sweet spot of still making their consumers feel like a human is is with them but having all of the back technology that takes people forward to you know actually purchase to inspire to keep creating so i i quite liked that term and basically if brands don't do that and they don't have those two key factors they're going to find it very difficult to survive going forward I think that that's very, very wise advice. Um, I think it's hard. I think it's hard to do, though, right? Because I think we, we do take for granted as much as we were on this journey, not just fashion, full stop, every sector was on this sort of digitalization journey and understanding the customer. This has just put so much pressure and accelerated so much so quickly. So I, I have loads of empathy. I think it, it's, it's easier said than done. But yeah, I I think it's just really important to kind of note, like, you know, to shift your company to do a really well oiled e com, you know, takes money, it takes technology. And, you know, smaller brands, startup designers who kind of actually relied on um, yeah. having like e tailors and retailers sell their collections in order to create really suffered. So, you know, there has definitely been people who have kind of been quite decimated by the pandemic and we have seen that in luxury brands too tory birch had reduced sales uh we recently interviewed christopher kane who actually has really downsized his collection started painting during the pandemic you know so it takes it takes a lot of focus so the brands that have done really well already had digital strategies in place but then they just were all stations go you know how can we make our interactions quicker how many more people can we make so that um after click of delivery, you know, it gets delivered really quickly. So yeah. I think people have suffered, but also some people have really blossomed. I mean, ASOS, Farfetch, Amazon, you know, you can really see that, but they already had these systems in place. Yeah, I think that is the, the, the big distinction. They were set up on the whole as tech companies first, and they so happen to be in fashion. I think that that is a, a huge distinction. So to, add, to make things more complicated and get your crystal ball out again, and we're obviously starting to come out in terms of stores opening in most parts of EMEA, what, you know, how do you see it kind of playing out, this, this um, I suppose, the relationship between the e-commerce experience versus the physical store experience now stores are finally opening? I mean, you know, in, in London, at least, I think, physically there's had to be big changes uh stores have had to rethink their merchandising so that people can make their way around the store of course you've got things like masks um certain brands have invested in curbside pickup um brands like burberry and bottega are doing kind of whatsapp conversations where they're videoing and then someone can come and collect their items and so i think physical spaces have had, had to obviously kind of be post-pandemic focused yeah. but what I really like is actually because of travel restrictions lots of brands have had to kind of forget their global outlook when it comes to retail and actually think of their local outlook you know there's no point in London curating a store for the Chinese consumer yeah. if they can't travel here so I think it's really interesting like Alexander McQueen is a great example of this who actually did it in China, which was no one can travel. Let's stop thinking about international travelers. Yeah. What does our Chinese consumer want? What does the consumer in this city want? And in London, we're seeing that too. So I think that's actually really progressive for yeah. physical retail. And then in terms of e-com, you know, it's just the e-com boom and it's basically efficiency. You know, how quickly is everything going to load? How yeah. easy is it for me to find a product, put it into the cart and pay? And so when it comes to e-com, it's, it's essentially just like convenience, convenience, convenience. And if they don't have that, then, you know, that's well, it's just going to work. Well, what's interesting, touching what you said about people not being able to travel, having um, spoken to a few of the um, large designers uh, based out of Paris recently, literally, they were talking about this exact same thing, that because they don't have the international uh, traveler coming to Europe per se, actually they're having to start thinking about their collections and who are they who are they designing for? Because actually, exactly. 
it could be changing their customer base essentially in certain parts of the world, which I thought, again, fascinating insight I hadn't really thought about. You know, I think this whole kind of rise of a staycation is a trend that's going to stay here this yeah. year and probably will to a certain aspect yeah. next year. And so, yeah, I think designers have to really think about the women they're designing for and where are they actually selling their clothes the most? What does yeah. that woman want? And, you know, equally, I think the products have changed themselves. I think we've all been, you know, there was kind of like the tracksuit and then it was kind of like athleisure wear and cashmere. I mean, I still find it really hard to part from my gym gear. So, you know, I do think designers have to really think, what do I enjoy doing? And yeah. what does the woman or man, you know, what does my consumer really want? So there has been a huge shift. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because if you just look at um, businesses like Kering or LVMH, they've had pretty good earnings. So, like, yeah. interestingly, growth, I mean, I think because we're, we're all sitting in Europe at, at, or EMEA, that we see things a bit more probably doom and gloom in our parts of the world because we've been slower to come out of the pandemic. But clearly for them, where they rely on Asia and the US, they've had a lot of success. So it's interesting. Do you see this growth continuing? Like, clearly they've got to adapt but like, what's your view of, I suppose, fashion full stop in terms of the future and the growth potential? Well, yeah, L LVMH basically kind of had like a record first first quarter of the year, which, you know, I think really did surprise a lot of people. Um, but, you know, a lot of the brands under the caring and LVMH kind of stables um, have a lot of money to be able to quickly adapt to changing supply chains or disruptions and to kind of forward their technologies and I kind of think in the future I do think the retail industry is going to recover there's going to be certain parts of the industry that are more heavily affected uh, smaller brands that aren't D2C with direct to consumer they're really going to struggle that you know and I think have kind of been decimated during the pandemic but brands kind of going forward as you said really need to think about um the consumer and the digital experience and if they can really get the dna of their consumer and constantly innovate their digital experience then the retail in industry is going to recover but it, it will be a while but you know as i said we we are seeing these results but we also have to think that's really high high end and of course there's lots of other aspects of the retail industry too yeah, it's definitely the other aspects where I shop. So I'm not for one minute pretending I'm definitely the caring customer. Um, I think we can't talk about the future. And I think we have been very bullish, actually, at Snap about this sort of next generation, because there is so much doom and gloom, particularly because this next generation have been hit with employment, especially the older end of Generation Z. Yeah, I actually I mean, we were talking about this before, weren't we, Flora, that Actually, we're pretty optimistic. This is a generation that are defining what the future looks like and have the skills um, to do it. So when we think about that next generation, all the work and insights that you're seeing, what impact do you think they're going to have on, I suppose, e-com or just in retail full stop? Well, I, what I think is really kind of interesting about um, the Gen Z kind of generation is they're already kind of making huge waves. And actually what it is, it's brands just trying to keep up. They all have multi devices. They're all obsessed with micro retail and resell. They're really their own CEOs and entrepreneurs. They're selling off multiple websites. You know, they've got uh, gaming, they've got a uh, Depop, they've got Snapchat. They're really kind of well versed in this digital technology. But they have already lived through uh, quite a lot. They already lived through the recession. They were kind of key to Me Too. They've seen Black Lives Matter. They have a lot of empathy for social and, and ethical causes. And they are the ones demand, demanding social justice, um, better payment for workers, but also sustainability practices. A lot of next gen will go to a website. Where is this garment made? Can I see this brand's authenticity and transparency? And that's kind of really going to shape future shopping. Um, but their voice has really been heightened during the pandemic because they're speaking up on these on these platforms so much. So that's going to be driving innovation hugely. Yeah, and I, I often talk about this. This is the generation that care about how the clothes are made how the people making them, what they're paid, like they're going to ask those difficult questions to a lot of businesses. And I think if they don't have the right answers, they will absolutely not yeah. buy into it. They and care about accountability. 
Yeah, and I think values-based businesses will succeed with whatever sector you're in. And I suppose building on that, so I think, so for particularly the fashion or retail sector, I think there has been a challenge with sustainability. Uh, they've got a big challenge, obviously, with um, try on returns is one, but they've got a lot of things they still have to work on to drive, particularly your point about e-com is all about efficiencies. There's still so many inefficiencies in it. Now, this, yeah, this is me not, I promise, plugging Snap, but clearly we are pretty passionate about augmented reality and believe it is an opportunity to connect the physical and digital uh, with try on in, this, in the example of fashion. So what do you, you know, what's your vision of kind of the role augmented reality could play in all of this to help, I suppose, combat some of these challenges? Well, I think we're kind of already seeing quite a lot of brands embrace the AR reality. Um, I kind of just want to highlight a slightly smaller um, brand, their creation, they're called Tribute Band. Uh, they're a digital fashion house um, and they do everything um, in drops. So their collections are little drops. They cost anything between um, 60 to 700 pounds and you send in your photo and they'll create these kind of amazing like metallic-y dresses. And that's kind of an example of a brand that's still giving a consumer what they want because they can format it for Instagram, they can format it for yeah. TikTok. So consumers are still getting that dopamine hit of I'm wearing something really cool or no, I'm wearing something new. But yeah. then there's none of the waste behind it. And let's be honest, a lot of the generation want that instant gratification. Um, and you're also seeing that with luxury brands. Gucci did their AR sneakers they cost $18, but to buy a pair of Gucci sneakers is usually like $500. So again, it's making it more democratic, more accessible. And young people find it really fun. They get to have that access to luxury that they might never be able to have in an, in, in the reality, you know, in the real world, but in the, you know, digital world, the world's are oyster. So I think that's really exciting. And we'll definitely see more of that going forward. Yeah, I mean, I was impressed because we obviously did try on with Gucci and the sneakers where you could buy the really expensive version. And you know, people were doing it. And, and I think it is just, whereas I think if you thought about that far, even five years ago, you'd gone, oh, people won't buy those type of product without physically trying them on. And I think the likes of Netta Porter, Farfet, have proven otherwise. And I think AR is just another part of that experience that can kind of bring luxury to life. Um, thinking about that next generation full stop across retail, well, I it's say retail rather than just fashion, what are the other trends that you're seeing? You know, what other things are they doing that's going to start to define uh, the changes we're going to continue to see post this pandemic? Well, it's, it's kind of almost what we've really discussed. Like what they're going to want is they're going to want brands to be more transparent, they're going to want to embrace the digital and physical world. They still want to have physical retail stores. Mm -hmm. They still crave that interaction. But if there's not seamless digital to physical, then that's not really going to work. I think the increase in social issues, we're going to see that only getting kind of more ingrained and deeper as they become the next generation of business starters. They're going to have this ethos that kind of millennials and above didn't really start with and actually we're kind of late to the game and when we were talking about fashion embracing AR you know gaming was doing this years ago and that's only now you know coming to the fore but this already existed for them so we're just going to see that continue and grow and blossom and brands will really have to pick up on that. And again, like, you know, even beauty, not just fashion, yeah. you're trying on your lipsticks digitally, trying on different makeups digitally. You've got, obviously got all these filters. That's just going to become part of normal life. There's always going to be a sense of a need for a physical space because physical spaces are where we discover. And we also get that physical sense of community. But, you know, Gen Z are just going to keep plowing on with these issues. And it's really going to be up to us to kind of keep up with them. No, I love I love the concept of physical space being discovery, essentially. I think that's a really interesting way and actually a simple way to think about it. And um, this is where I want to kind of get you to name some businesses that you're seeing, that I suppose, that bring to life all the things that you've just discussed of, of doing it the right way and examples of what they're doing and why you think that's so great. Well, to kind of you kind of bring, keep keep bringing myself back to fashion, but you know, I think Burberry and Balenciaga uh, really 
really showed their promise um, during the pandemic of where they're going to take this technology. Um, Balenciaga for their Autumn Winter 21 collection actually showed it in a video game with AR headsets and you could like watch these models going past. You could see other people. I mean, it was it was amazing feat of technology, but it was so engaging and a great way to kind of bring people all together. There was no need to fly everyone across the world. You could literally sit at your kitchen table and attend one of the most elite runway shows, you know, that you could ever be yeah. invited to. So I thought that was really cool. Burberry have been doing this kind of augmented reality for a really long time. They started by doing kind of apps on their phone where you could take it around the store and see stuff. But recently I went to their pop-up space in Harrods and they have these 3D printed statues next to their bags and you scan a code that's around the bags and you can then hold up your camera to the statues and they come to life and they start walking around and you can take selfies and pictures of yourself with yeah. these statues whilst you're shopping, whilst you're looking at all these beautiful things. And, you know, they're only going to do that more. They're about to have a massive new big flagship space. And their main thing is integrating that digital and physical space. And, you know, even on the high street, Zara have just invested like 2.7 billion pounds. Um, I want to get that right, 2.7 um, into basically making sure that their stores have a digital experience too. So it's really starting to translate across the, you know, across the board. And I'm curious, do you think though, with all the integrations of all the digital essentially tools, um, it's going to help luxury keep distinct and different to sort of more than the mass? Or do you think it's going to bring them closer together in the, in the, in the customer experience? Uh, that's that's a really really uh, good point because I think digital in many ways is democratic, but yeah. even um, augmented reality try-ons have their own have their own difficulties because because it costs a lot of money. There's no one centralized system. Mm -hmm. Companies have to kind of invest in their own technologies. So even if luxury fashion goes full steam ahead with AR it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to be able to get on board with that or be able to access it, but it does really open it up. And equally, they are luxury for a reason. They are made beautifully handcrafted in these factories. You're not seeing that in a fa fast fashion you know, website. And you know, the whole kind of fun and joy of AR try on for luxury is because you know that you might not be able to access it all the time. But we all could pop to, you know, pop to our kind of local high street retailer or go on ASOS or order something, you know, really quickly. So that sense of I think luxury brands will have to keep their sense of magic whilst also giving that kind of magic to more people, which sounds, you know, quite hard to yeah. get your head around. But I think that's what they're going to have to do in order to survive, basically. Yeah, I mean, I've been talking a lot about this in general, like I think personalization and the right type mm. of personalization is going to have to be key because I think that's where digital comes into it. So if it's done correctly, and I think luxury is just going to get to know their customer even better and give them more of a bespoke experience. That That is kind of, in layman's terms, that's what I see happening. Yeah, completely. And you kind of see that already in, in the stores that have opened up with tons of bespoke personalization services. I mean, there's a calligrapher in Louis Vuitton and you can just be there on your on your FaceTime and they'll kind of do it for you. Yeah. And like, you don't even kind of need to be there, but it's that one-to-one -one interaction. You don't even need to come into the store, but you still feel like you're, you're, you know, you can see your piece being made in front of you. You're not even there. And yeah. I think those kind of interactions, as you said, that personalization really is key. And of course, that's not the uh, MO of a mass retailer. Yeah. They want to get everyone, it's collective data, Whereas luxury, it actually yeah. needs to start with the individual going outwards and kind of going back to that global local. That's what I think is really cool at the moment is actually we kind of have this like more localized view rather than trying to get this huge pool of people and kind of work out what everyone wants. Yeah, let's just touch on that because I'm fascinated by the relationship. I think the pandemic has made us more local, which is so ironic because it's a global pandemic. Yeah. Do you yeah. see that going further, us becoming more local, actually, over the long term? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, y Pulse and Gen Z Planet were kind of doing all these surveys over the past year. And at least in Gen Z terms, 
uh, around 20% said they would want to shop more locally, around 40% said they wanted to make more ethical purchases. Um, I think even the habits of older generations have changed, whereas, you know, um, I would have gone and done my food shopping in the shops, you know, pretty much weekly. I now have a weekly delivery. That's probably going to continue. And I think, you know, even, you know, my dad's doing the same thing. <laughs> he absolutely loves stores. So I do think we're now going to have kind of these permanent shifts. And that's why all these kind of apps like Get Here and stuff in London, which is local grocery shopping, um, have really blossomed because, you know, people are kind of thinking about their homes and where we are now. It's also why we've had this huge interior boom. I don't know if you remember in the first lockdown, you couldn't even get paint and certain things. Yeah. People were suddenly thinking internally and, and not externally. Yeah. And that won't change in our psyche soon. You know, the world is going to open up, but there's still going to be a sense of people reevaluating what they want and what they want to spend their money on. I think that's true. Now, for a lot of people tuning in this morning who may not be part of a Burberry or an LVMH, you know, what advice would you give them in adapting their businesses um, to all the changes that we really discussed? And are there a couple of key things you'd be saying to a business to focus on that could make their greatest impact? I mean, I think the kind of easiest things is, you know, get yourselves onto social media ASAP. Think about what age your consumer is. If it's a little bit older, focus on Instagram. If it's a little bit younger, focus on TikTok and Snapchat. Um, I think it's very important to think the majority of brands need to be D to C now. Um, if we have any future pandemics, let's fingers crossed never again, but and supply chains are disrupted, you need to be the controller of your own business. So you need to think about how you're getting your money. And also in D to C, you're going to have a huge amount of data with your consumer and be able to interact with them and get what they want. So I think, you know, having a physical space is amazing but you really need to partner that with your digital presence and I think engagement is going to be key now and you know engagement is kind of a word that gets used all the time but engagement is going to be key because you need to be talking do you have someone else who can talk on social media to your clients when you can't so I think that's what people should do right now going forward I mean if I started a fashion brand right now I'd, I'd do D2C for sure. Well, I think that's some very good advice. So I think that's a, a, a good place to end. So I want to say a huge thank you, Flora. I think uh, you are extraordinary, not just because of the amount of stuff that you do, but your passion. And I think having you as a champion in the retail industry gives me confidence that will continue to flourish. Um, I well, think um, what I've heard loud and clear, though, today is I think stay focused on that next generation because I think they are showing us the way of what's to come. Yeah. And Happening. And I think anyone, even if you've got a traditional business with legacy infrastructure, so to speak, like take notes because I think you yeah. have to adapt. Um, I totally agree with the continued focus on local. Bizarrely, as we live in such a global world, we are going to be more local for some time. So thinking about that. I loved your sort of snappy comments about e-coms about efficiency. I think the physical world will be about discovery, which I think is really, really key. Don't stop talking to your customers. I've met, spoken to loads of founders recently that call their customers their community, which I think is a great way to think about that. Keep engaged. And if it was up to Flora, she would be setting up a D2C brand to, tomorrow. I would. <laughs> well, huge thank you again. I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation and I think we could keep going. So, But at that point, I will say thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks for having me. Hi everyone, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today. My name is Simon Jenkins and I lead our creative strategy team across our international emerging business. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you all about the world of e-commerce on Snapchat, particularly as over the past 18 months or so, we've really seen our e-commerce partners across the business drive innovation and push the boundaries of what's possible through the Snapchat camera driving incredible results and in some cases transforming their business. A lot of this was driven by the pandemic and the need for brands of all sizes to begin to think different. There's no doubting that the world of shopping has moved to mobile. This was happening before the pandemic and has only been accelerated with the events of the past year or so. The traditional retail showroom now fits in the pockets of your consumers. Consumers that are the most creative, connected and camera native generation. This is the Snapchat generation 
At Snap, we realize the camera is no longer a piece of hardware. It's no longer a piece of hardware simply used to commemorate and capture special moments with your friends and family. It has evolved into something much bigger than that. It's evolved into powerful software, unlocking the ability to connect the physical with the digital world. It can change the world around you, the sky, famous buildings and landmarks, the street you live on, or it can offer you the ability to change your clothes, try on those sneakers, or check a new shade of lipstick. Through augmented reality, we're helping brands like yours offer product discovery, product trial, and so much more, particularly at a time when access to physical stores has been either limited or simply not possible. The Snapchat generation has become three times more likely than non-Snapchatters to use augmented reality to try on, driving the shift towards virtual shopping experiences. Just as having a digital and mobile strategy was necessary to evolve with the changes over the last 10 years, at Snapchat, we truly believe every business, big or small, needs a camera strategy to evolve with these shifts in shopping behavior. This is the most rewarding aspect of working in the creative strategy team at Snapchat. Every day, we help brands transform the way in which they use the camera across their business to solve genuine business problems, delivering fun, useful, convenient commerce experience for their prospective customers. This can be from the world's largest and best loved luxury brands, creating AR experiences for their global product drops, to independent retailers building a simple AR try-on experience to push a new product line. Snap's camera has gotten smarter, ushering in a revolution in augmented reality. For us, AR is not an objective. Augmented reality is the format. And this is a format which 200 million Snapchatters play with every single day. It's a format that is completely embedded into the culture of the Snapchat generation, as our community plays with lenses nearly 30 times per day. We have evolved as a platform to not only bring fun and joy to the Snapchat camera, but also utility. One of the most important areas of AR investment and the quickest areas of development and innovation has come from AR shopping experiences. From enveloping someone into your curated virtual store so that they can explore no matter where they are in the world, to helping someone try on or visualize your products before they buy from a simple tap, from giving them really useful information after they've bought, to even creating digital only products. The Snapchat camera is a canvas of unprecedented creativity and utility for businesses both big and small. And the implementation of these camera strategies is resulting in incredible success for our clients. Leveraging a camera strategy is helping brands drive results through every stage of the customer journey. Campaigns with lenses see a 25% higher lift in ad awareness and product awareness, plus a 67% lift in action intent than those without lenses. Traditional advertising simply lets users see a product. The Snapchat camera allows users to truly experience the product, whether that's as a 3D object in the world around them or physically augmented onto their body. What's more is that Snapchatters are experiencing this on a platform where they can seamlessly engage with their closest friends for instant feedback. And from the lens, they can tap the lens attachment and be taken directly into app or site where they can purchase. And experiencing really is believing. We see a 2.4 times higher average intent lift with Snapchat lens campaigns. Take this lens from Swiss retailer Nikin, for example. We took a series of their best-selling products, a hoodie, a t-shirt, a beanie, and allowed users to try on three different looks. Once the user was happy with a particular look or style, they could visit their site with one tap and start browsing. Their return on ad spend from this lens was 30 times higher than their ads across other platforms. Or most recently, this lens from German dental brand, Dr. Smile. We wanted to give Snapchatters the chance to experience what a clear aligner could do to their smile. Using a slider to represent the amount of time wearing the aligner, the user can see what results they could achieve. 
They can flip their camera and using GPS coordinates, we can show them where their nearest dental practice is to offer them an initial consultation. This marrying of the physical and digital world produced incredible results and Snapchat has fast become their most efficient paid social channel. For me, the most exciting part of all of this is how alongside bringing huge technical advances to the Snapchat camera, we've made it easier than ever for brands to create these AR experiences. There are three simple ways to build AR. Firstly, we've been focused on democratizing AR, so all brands have access to it. With Lens Studio, anyone can begin to create these experiences working from a series of templates we have available. I encourage each of you to download Lens Studio and start giving it a go. Secondly, our internal lens team can build the lens for you and send it to your device for you to play with. Or lastly, we can hook you up with one of our amazing AR partners we work with across the world. The barrier to entry for AR is lower than ever. We would love to speak to you about your concepts you already have, or indeed host an ideation session with you and your wider team to discuss how we can create an AR experience that's fun, engaging, and drives results for your brand. Hey all, I'm thrilled to be with you today. I'm Megan and I work on our product marketing team here at Snap, working on building a bunch of new tools specifically for e-commerce focused businesses. We've been busy building new shoppable formats, commerce integrations, measurement and attribution products, and more. And I'm excited to walk you through our suite of tools that'll help you drive real results for your business. First, we'll cover the Snapchat generation and how they are primed to take action. Then we'll dive into how commerce is changing and how the Snapchat generation is at the forefront of this change. And we'll close out with a deep dive into our commerce solutions and a few case studies that highlight proven ROI for direct response commerce campaigns. First, let's meet the Snapchat generation and explore how they're influential, unique, engaged, and action-oriented. Gen Zers and Millennials are digitally savvy and think mobile first. And Snapchat has truly captured this generation's attention. On average, we have 265 million daily active users, and this number keeps growing, jumping 22% in 2020. And this influential group matters for your business. This generation has over $4.4 trillion of direct spending power. Their purchase power has ballooned and will continue to grow over the next five years as Gen Z and millennials enter their peak spending years and surpass Gen X and baby boomers. Positioning the Snapchat generation as the pipeline of new consumers for brands to win today and the future of spend over the next five years. Not only is this generation influential, they're also unique to Snapchat. We reach more 13 to 24 year olds than Facebook or Instagram in the US, UK, France, Canada, and Australia. If you want to reach millennials and Gen Z where they are every day, you need to be on Snapchat. This is proof that if we were not part of your media mix, you're missing reaching all of your audience. We capture an important audience that's hard to reach on other platforms. And in fact, they are unduplicated and incremental to your efforts. As you can see here in the UK, 56% of Snapchatters 16 plus are not on Facebook and 82% are not on Twitter. And in France, 64% of Snapchatters 16 plus aren't on Facebook and 86% aren't on Messenger. And in Saudi Arabia, 73% of Snapchatters aren't on Facebook and 91% aren't on TikTok. Reaching this unique and incremental audience is important. And in order to also drive recency, it's crucial to try and maximize the number of opportunities on any given day that you can deliver a message. We're inherently advantaged in this because of how much mind share we grasp on a daily basis. Snapchatters are engaged. They spend over 30 minutes from when they wake up to when they commute to when they're shopping and going to sleep. And these all represent opportunities to deliver a message and incentivize action. And this generation is action oriented to boot. Based on a survey asking which activities Snapchatters are doing more of since the outbreak of COVID-19, 21% said that they are shopping more. And what's more, Snapchatters are willing to outspend non-Snapchatters across every category. In fact, the Snapchat generation would spend as much as 50% more on discretionary items, such as a new mobile phone. 
Now that you've met the Snapchat generation, let's take a look at the state of commerce today. Not only has COVID affected the way that people have been able to connect with one another, it's also further changed the shopping landscape. And this new landscape relies even more heavily on digital. E-commerce truly exploded in 2020, accelerating a shift away from physical stores and towards online shopping. We saw how brands like yours adapted, and we want to celebrate the results up front. In the U.S. alone, the growth rate almost tripled, reaching an incredible 44% by Q2, more growth in nine months of 2020 than the previous nine years. And this significant upward trend was seen across all regions, with total e-commerce sales worldwide exceeding expectations. And we believe the Snapchat generation is accelerating this growth. As the most digitally savvy group, Gen Zers and young millennials had no problem shifting their purchasing completely online during the pandemic. In the past month alone, 84% browsed on online retailer from a mobile device. And when it comes to making the purchase, their shopping experience is everywhere their phone is, a utility that's proven exponentially beneficial as they've sheltered in place and continued to cope with COVID-19 limitations. To reach this generation, brands will need to speak to Snapchatters in a ways that matter and resonate, and this means meeting them on mobile. Already, 73% make a purchase on mobile at least once a month, and 60% make in-app purchases. These changes are shaping the future. Considering the growing purchasing power of this generation, you can't help but notice the wave of change in commerce and how this generation of mobile natives has steadily pushed mobile commerce forward. Now that you're familiar with our community, let's get tactical. There are many ways you can reach them organically on Snapchat and through our robust Snapchat ads platform. Since the beginning, we've innovated. We were the pioneers of vertical video and ephemeral messaging, and we continue to innovate to better serve our large and engaged community. Specifically in the wonderful world of commerce, we've recently launched and expanded our suite of tools that power our dynamic ads formats. Your product catalog is a critical component to automating and scaling dynamic campaigns. And similarly, we've begun exploring how your product catalogs can be surfaced in places throughout the Snapchat ecosystem. Public profiles for businesses offer a permanent home for brands on Snapchat and are built to multiply the impact of your existing efforts on Snap. With a profile, brands can feature four key types of content, a public story, AR lenses, highlights, and a native store powered by Shopify. Brands can be easily found in search and unlike regular accounts, Snapchatters can subscribe to a brand which will service their content in For You, Discover, and Lens Explorer. Brands can also manage their organic account through tools and analytics directly in the Snapchat app and on the web in Business Manager. Snapchatters can subscribe to a brand profile and this will enable content from the business to appear in the subscriptions carousel of Discover and within Lens Explorer, which is separate from Friends. Brands can save and showcase lenses on their profile, allowing any Snapchatter to discover or revisit a brand's unique AR experiences. And with highlights, you can showcase collections of your best public snaps, stories, photos, everything right there on your profile permanently. And it really is a great way for Snapchatters who aren't familiar with your brand to get to know who you are. You can also review analytics and insights about your subscribers, lenses on mobile or web. And similar to public profiles, you can now see audience demographics and interests for those who view your stories. And most relevant for commerce, the native store. Profiles may include a native store experience that enables Snapchatters to seamlessly browse and purchase items directly within the Snapchat app. And this is currently powered by Shopify. We're only just scratching the surface of native shopping and you can expect much more innovation from us in this space soon. We're excited to expand our organic offerings for businesses to complement our suite of direct response tools on our Snapchat ads platform including full screen commerce ads, purchase event bidding, dynamic catalog feeds, direct data integrations, advanced targeting, and measurement and attribution products. At Snapchat, our ad products are built to serve all objectives and they all work together to inspire an action from dynamic ads to snap ads to collection ads and story ads. Each format drives purchases in different ways. 
Let's double tap on our dynamic ads product, which is truly a made for commerce format. You can easily leverage pre-existing templates that are designed to showcase products visually, making your ads look beautiful and native to the platform. Because our audience is predisposed to shop on mobile, we wanted to ensure we were designing the most optimal shopping experience on mobile as well. Our dynamic ads are full screen, which maximizes the real estate of the images that are displayed, inviting potential shoppers to explore more by directly swiping up to your website or app to learn more. Through a combination of importing your product catalog and employing one of our direct data integrations on your website or within your app, we can power a dynamic ads campaign. And we recently added dynamic collection ads with two options that allow you to seamlessly create a multi-product unit that dynamically populates tiles directly from your product catalog. First, you can automatically create your entire collection ad from products synced from your catalog, or you can manually upload a custom video or image with a unique brand message and still dynamically populate the tiles along the bottom of the collection ad from your product catalog. And to take dynamic collection ads one step further towards a truly native experience, we've also added an optional native showcase attachment that you can use as a supplement to your web or app shopping pages. On Swipe Up, the Snapchatter goes to the native showcase attachment where they can browse your products and learn more about you. And then after tapping on a product tile, the Snapchatter would be taken to your product page. Similar to other dynamic ads, Showcase is populated by products in your catalog and dynamically ranked to show the right products to the right people at the right time. Showcase has a variety of rich features and a few to highlight that extend beyond what our dynamic collection ads offer would be that it's a native shopping experience, similar to what Snapchatters experience on our app on a regular basis. It allows them to browse products without ever leaving the app. We also have an optional banner where you can highlight product features or a message such as free shipping or some other incentive to really drive home that you want that Snapchatter to click through on the products and continue exploring on your site or in your app. We're continuing to expand our dynamic ads formats too. Next, we'll be launching dynamic story ads later this month. And with all dynamic ads, there are two targeting options available. First, with prospecting, your dynamic ads will reach Snapchatters who may or may not have visited your website. And this is a great way to start generating demand at the top of the funnel. Alternatively, you can reach people who are likely to have already visited your website or purchased previously through a retargeting audience. With Apple's app tracking transparency or ATT changes, we recommend prioritizing prospecting spend in dynamic ads campaigns and looking for new ways to drive scale. Use either a web view or deep link attachment to drive traffic to specific products on your site or in app. And as you drive more users to your site or app, you can then build lookalikes of pixel custom audiences or snap audience match audiences or even Android audiences to increase the scale of your prospecting campaigns post ATT. We know we've spent a ton of time covering e-commerce and mobile commerce, but we all know that in-store retail is still driving the vast majority of purchases. If you have localized services such as a retailer or a hotel chain, explore location tools for dynamic ads. With this, you can include location information from your catalog, such as lat long or availability radius, and ensure that your products are being served to Snapchatters that fall within each product location. With increased location awareness, your message or offer can be as relevant as possible wherever your customer is in the world. We've covered some of our top creative formats and advanced targeting capabilities that help you market your products to the right people. But the secret sauce behind the scenes is our goal-based bidding that allows you to optimize for the results that matter the most for your business, whether that's driving purchases on your website or in your app, or objectives higher up in the funnel, like driving video views, app installs, leads, and more. And these are designed to really help you optimize for those results at any stage of the funnel. From a measurement perspective, we've been laser focused on improving and expanding what we're calling our direct data integrations. I'm sure Apple's app tracking transparency or ATT is top of mind. And all of these solutions are free, designed with security in mind and allow for improved targeting, measurement and optimization. 
First, the snap pixel is a multi-feature JavaScript tag and the implementation is simple with minimal maintenance and we even offer one-click installation for partners like Shopify, WooCommerce, and Google Tag Manager. App Ads Kit is most relevant for app advertisers. It's our first multi-feature SDK that can be embedded in your app to measure, target, and optimize app-based actions. Conversions API is another option for advertisers who want to measure omni-channel actions, including in-store purchases. And this can be set up server to server, but does require a higher level of effort, including engineering resources. Now let's bring our toolkit all together with some format and objective and targeting selections that you can combine today. Lenses bring the world, products, and incredible experiences to shoppers and consumers, no matter where they are in the world. And lenses are powerful because they offer not only impressions, but playtime with your brand. AR lenses support website, app install, and deep link attachments, and we recommend targeting shopper audiences, re-engagement audiences, or utilizing our Snapchat lifestyle categories. For commerce brands with mobile apps, driving app installs is a great way to re-engage mobile shoppers. As we talked through earlier, consumers are rapidly shifting to mobile commerce, especially the Snapchat generation. We recommend a combination of Snap and Story ads with app install attachments, with broader targeting to drive that higher funnel action and engage new customers. Creating lookalikes will also help drive scale. To convert brand advocates into buyers, we recommend our performance-driven solutions. And we recommend sequencing your messaging with high intent Snapchatters who swiped up on or completed viewing your Snap ads. This particular audience seeks additional content. And this is a great way to continue building consideration with them. As this retargeting pool becomes smaller post ATT, we'd again recommend creating lookalike audiences to regain scale. We've spent some time already covering dynamic ads, but to reiterate, this is our bread and butter format for commerce campaigns. We offer both Snap Ad and Collection Ads with WebView, Install, or Deep Link attachments. And as noted, we'll be adding Story Ads to the mix very soon. Now, let's take a look at how other brands are achieving real results on our platform. We've proven on Snapchat that we deliver a $3 return on ad spend, which is 20% higher than digital norms. Christian Dior was one of the first brands to leverage public profiles on Snapchat to generate early excitement as soon as their sneakers were released. They posted an AR lens allowing users to try on six different models of their new B27 sneakers. In addition to promotion via paid advertising, Christian Dior generated more than 2.3 million views of their lens thanks to their public profile. Next, let's take a look at Gymshark. Following high conversion results from Snapchat campaigns, Gymshark used story ads to launch its new sports bra collection and create a more personalized journey. This education-led campaign resonated well with female Snapchatters, encouraging CTRs and purchases. Compared to forecasts, they saw a 2.5x lower cost per sale, 100% more purchases, and 2.5x lower cost per action. Kitsch was looking to find a new channel to hit their desired ROAS at scale, and they were able to quickly find success on Snapchat. To showcase their large selection of items, Kitsch utilized Snapchat's collection ads to help drive purchases of their top performing products. They saw over 6x ROAS on collection ads alone, and not only were they able to scale budgets effectively and efficiently, they were also able to tap into audiences that they couldn't reach on other platforms. Over 29% of purchases came from a young female demographic that they had a hard time reaching on other platforms. Showroom Preve used an AR lens to promote an online competition in a fun and entertaining way and generated a strong engagement rate on our lens and also drove purchases to their e-commerce website as a side effect. Through upbeat creative prominently featuring a call to action in popular product categories, Zaffel was able to acquire high intent customers using minimum ROAS bidding and multi-country targeting. They saw a 20% lower cost per purchase and 30% increase in ROAS based on this strategy. Well, that's it for me. I hope you found this deep dive into e-commerce on Snapchat informative and inspiring. That's it guys. Thank you for tuning in and joining us today. We hope you found it useful, informative, and inspiring. For all of those working with us already, thank you so much for your ongoing partnership. And for those of you who don't yet, we hope to work with you in the future.
We can't wait to continue to grow, learn and innovate together. Wishing you all a really great day.